Hey, what is up everybody? I am here with Carolyn Rogers. We just did a video on blockchain and now we're going to be talking about cryptocurrencies. So do you care to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about what cryptocurrencies are? Sure. Uh, thanks, Caleb. I'm Carolyn Rogers. I work for IBM. I'm on the team that's building the IBM blockchain platform. And so what is cryptocurrency? Um, the basic definition is that it's a digital currency where all the data and transactions are recorded in a cryptographic way. A cryptocurrency is different from what is called a fiat currency, which is you know the money that you and I are used to using, the US dollar and other uh, currencies that are backed by a government or an institution, a central institution. Does anyone back the cryptocurrencies? No, they do not. Okay. So cryptocurrencies are not centrally backed by any institution. They actually run autonomously on technology called blockchain. So they run by themselves, essentially. Okay. So cryptocurrencies are powered by the blockchain. That's right. right, yes. Can you explain what the blockchain is just for the people who didn't see the previous video? Sure. So let me back up to 2008, which was when Satoshi Nakamoto released a white paper describing Bitcoin. So Bitcoin was the first cryptocurrency, and it described a system of transacting peer-to-peer -peer with no financial intermediaries and underpinned by a technology, which is, was basically a link of transactions grouped into blocks and linked into a chain, hence the blockchain. So blockchain technology is really what makes cryptocurrency possible. Okay, so this is like essentially a linked list where these blocks contain transactions. That's correct, exactly, yeah. Right on. Yeah. I actually know something. <laughs> so you talked about fiat currency, the money we use on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And I can go to a store and buy stuff with this. Right. So why would I want to use a cryptocurrency? Right, okay. So, so in the real world, if I want to give you money, I have my dollar and I can give it to you and I know that that transaction has, ha has happened, right? Yeah. Like you know that it's happened and I know that it's happened and we are, we're all happy. But as soon as you want to do that digitally, just think about any way that you want to send money to people over the internet or digitally in any way, it requires an intermediary. It requires a bank or some central entity to do that for you. And so you have to trust that entity that they are completing the transaction on your behalf. The reason why you would want a cryptocurrency is that you can actually transact. You can do you know, basically what we are doing in the real world, handing you a dollar, but you're doing it digitally and you're doing it directly to the other person without any intermediary in between. So it, it reduces friction, it reduces time, and it reduces the fees. But um, is there still some time involved in fees? Yes, there, there are, yeah. So there, there are still um, transaction fees uh, in cryptocurrency, but uh, it could be l less than the fees that you would pay if you were, for example, doing a cross-border payment when there were, there were a lot of settlements that needed yeah. to happen in between. I think it kind of depends on the cryptocurrency, That's right? That's correct. They're, they're, the fees vary, and the time it takes to, trans to settle a transaction can also vary. It is, so Bitcoin and many other crypto... <laughs> All right, so let's see. I lost the foot there. Yeah. <laughs> so I think there's a lot of confusion around Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Is this something that's 100% anonymous? Can you just kind of just explain a little bit more about it? Yeah, so, so anybody can use a cryptocurrency and cryptocurrencies vary, uh, they can vary on the amount of information you have to give about yourself and there are different ways to exchange cryptocurrency. But let's take the example of Bitcoin. Um, it is very anonymous. So you get, you have a, a, a public address and you have your private key and you um, can transfer your Bitcoin to anybody that you want. And all of the transactions are public. So everybody can see all the transactions that are happening on Bitcoin, but you don't know who's sending what to whom. Uh, so in that case, it is anonymous, but it's public. So you can see what's happening, but you don't know who's doing it. Okay. And what about the whole uh, thought that criminals use cryptocurrency? Can you explain that or debunk this myth? Yeah, I, I think it has to do with um, some of sort of underground um, dark web sorts of marketplaces where yes, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies have been used as a way to transact. Uh, but the thing about crypto cryptocurrencies is that they keep a perfect record of all of the, of the transactions that have occurred. So the other thing I, could, I would say about that is that when you have your, your money and all of your assets 
centralized, like with a bank or some other institution, um, that can be uh, vul vulnerable to threats such as hacks. Speaking of like fiat currency. Well, yes, it, right, or, or any other valuable asset. So um, when it's centralized, inherently that central, uh, that central entity can be vulnerable to attack. Um, so, you know, the reason why cryptocurrency is attractive is because it is de decentralized. Nobody's going to be hacking into the blockchain to steal, to steal Bitcoin. Um, it's very difficult and nearly impossible to do that. Okay, so I have a ton of money just lying around and I really want to buy a ton of cryptocurrency. So how do I go about buying it? Yeah, so there are different ways that you can buy cryptocurrency. The most um, easy on-ramp really is through something called an exchange. There are a number of different exchanges out there. Um, they list different currencies, so some only list a few, some list more, uh, and there are some that you can actually purchase directly. You can directly purchase the cryptocurrency with your, your fiat currency, your okay. dollars. Uh, and other current cryptocurrencies can only be purchased in the form of other cryptocurrency. So in some cases, if you wanted to purchase certain types of crypto, you would have to first buy, you know, say Bitcoin, for example, and then use that, maybe move it to another exchange and then um, buy the other cryptocurrency. I see. And this is where the, the anonymousness of of cryptocurrency isn't entirely 100% because yeah. in order to buy these things, you have to exchange some information. That's right. So there are different ways. So if you, if I wanted to directly send you Bitcoin, I could do that without an exchange by just sending it directly to your wallet. I could do that. But um, on an exchange, it makes it much easier to, to buy and sell your cryptocurrency. But the, the trade-off that you're making is that you're giving up some of your personal information uh, so that the exchange knows who you are. Oh, and so it's, it's re-centralizing in a way. Um, so there is some risk associated with that because and exchanges have been hacked. Yeah. Um, so, you know, for the trade-off of convenience, you're, you're giving up a little bit of, of, you know, privacy. You're giving up some of that information. Okay, so I take my money and I go to one of these exchanges and I, I give them my money in exchange for Bitcoin or whatever cryptocurrency right. it is. Mm -hmm. And then with that, the, you mentioned a, a public address and a, a private key. Can you explain what the difference between those are and like what do we do with those? You basically have a wallet uh, and you, you could have a wallet for every type of cryptocurrency okay. um, and that is like the address where people can send you the cryptocurrency and your private key is what allows you to access to have access to your wallet it's like it's almost like having a bank account and a password but it's, um, it's owned by you it's owned by <laughs> you exactly yeah so the exchanges when you get the the cryptocurrency you take it out of the exchange and put it into a wallet? You could. So um, the easy, th the very easy thing to do is you can just leave your money on the exchange and the exchange kind of holds your cryptocurrency for you. That's, uh, you know, for very maybe small amounts, uh, that's the easiest thing to do. If you're not worried about it being hacked or anything like that, maybe you're just experimenting, that's probably okay. Uh, but the, the more kind of offline you bring your cryptocurrency, the, the more secure it becomes. So you could keep your, your cryptocurrency on, a, on exchange, or you could have um, a mobile or an online wallet. So then that's like another level uh, of removal from the exchange. And then you could have a, a desktop wallet, which is offline. And that's even a, a little more secure. But you know, if you lose your laptop, that that's all gone. Okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, you, the, the more you bring it offline, the more the, uh, the responsibility rests on you as a human to, to make sure that you're keeping it secure. So, but there's some risk associated with that. So you could have your, you could keep your cryptocurrency. Um, there, there's actually, you could have a paper wallet. So that's literally a piece of paper with your, your public address and your private key printed on it. It's very ironic, at least I find yeah, it to be. You're getting rid of like, the physical money yeah. in exchange for uh, <laughs> digital money printed on, on paper. It's literally a piece of paper and it, it can't, nobody can hack it, but you could also lose a piece of paper. So, yeah. it, or you could put it in, in a bank, uh, in a vault, which is also very ironic, yeah. but so it depends. Um, and you know, with anything, you know, 
do your research and be careful. And if you're if you have huge sums of money in in the form of cryptocurrency, you should probably be yeah, disperse careful. It a little disperse bit, it. <laughs> yeah. If you're just doing small sums and you're not too worried about an exchange being hacked, you know, maybe you just keep it on an exchange. Okay. An exchange. Yeah. So these magical bitcoins and other cryptocurrencies, where do these come from? So Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are typically mined. Um, so there are people participating in the network who, in most cases, are lending their computing power, their, com their computer's resources, to the network in order to get cr cryptocurrency Bitcoin in return. So I can kind of rent out my computer processing power in exchange for Bitcoin? Exactly, yeah. Okay, so can you explain how, like, the, the new Bitcoin that I'm getting mm -hmm. from mining this. Can you go in a little bit more about how, how that works? Yeah. I want to send you some Bitcoin, okay. right? I want to send you, let's imagine I have five Bitcoin, which is a lot of, a lot of dollars. <laughs> <Thank> but <you. laughs> uh, let's say I want to do that. Um, so that transaction would have to be approved and agreed upon by a consensus mechanism. And that's based on the blockchain. That's based on the blockchain. So that transaction has to be agreed upon by the participants in the network uh, through something called a consensus mechanism. In the case of Bitcoin, it's proof of work. In many cryptocurrencies, that's the case. So the proof of work is basically the members, the participants of the network uh, who are mining, they are contributing their computing resource, they're renting out computer space uh, in order to solve the transaction. They're solving cryptographic puzzles with their computing space, which then uh, proves that the transaction has occurred and the the winner of that solving that problem is awarded with Bitcoin. So there's an alignment of incentives such that uh, the miners are incentivized to contribute their resource to the blockchain and the, at, at the same time they're making sure that tr the transaction is true and as a reward they get Bitcoin. Okay, I think I understand it all. <laughs> it's a little it's a little odd but yeah. uh, I think it technically makes sense. So essentially we have this blockchain and in the process of making a new block, which consists of transactions, yes. uh, when this block is complete, which it's completed by solving these uh, cryptographic problems, mm -hmm. once it's complete, the people that help solve these problems are rewarded the Bitcoin. That's right, yeah. And or so, cryptocurrency. Or, right. Is and that just a Bitcoin thing or is this uh, cryptocurrency wide? That, it it's, can slightly vary depending on cryptocurrencies, but I would probably say the, the vast majority employ proof of work. Proof of work uses a lot of electricity to work, so it's it can be inefficient um, and, and it requires a huge amount of computing resource. And some of like the, the newer cryptocurrencies are coming up with these alternative methods of building the, the blockchain? That's, that's right. There are other consensus mechanisms emerging, such as proof of stake where you have to, to uh, basically have some financial stake oh, in order to um, provide consensus or proof of elapsed time or proof of uh, proof uh, I'm like forgetting them uh, <laughs> proof of space um, yeah so there there are a number of consensus mechanisms that are emerging so when a new block is put onto this blockchain the the miners are rewarded Bitcoin mm -hmm. and will this Bitcoin ever run out uh, yes, technically it will. So there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin in circulation, um, and that they have not been all released in circulation yet. So when when Bitcoin first began, um, the reward for solving a block was 50 Bitcoin, um, and that is being cut in half every 210,000 blocks. Okay. So that that. Our, that ends up being about every four years. So today, if you were to solve a block and be rewarded all the Bitcoin, you would get 12 and a half Bitcoin, which is still pretty good, yeah. but it'll keep being cut <laughs> in half. <laughs> yeah, so eventually, uh, I, I think the last Bitcoin will be put into circulation around t uh, the year 2140 or so. And at that time, there will still be, uh, the, you will still need miners, but they will be rewarded only in the form of transaction fees, basically. So the, the incentive 
over time is, is getting less? It's decreased, that's correct, yeah. So you, you could probably do much better as a miner early on, and now it's much harder to make a profit as a miner. You need some pretty efficient machines. Yeah. Uh, so um, yeah, it's, it's declining over time. So I've heard of something called an ICO. Can you tell us what the acronym means and explain what it is? Sure, so an ICO is an initial coin offering, and it's basically a sale of a cryptocurrency to the public, and it's used as a tool for crowdfunding, for fundraising for startups and companies. So typically to start like a new project. Exactly, yeah. So the, the way it's different from something like an IPO or an initial public offering is that ICOs typically are at a much earlier stage. Can you explain IPOs? A yeah, bit? so an IPO is, is basically when, sh when shares of the company become available to the general public for purchase. Whereas in an ICO, you're not actually buying equity or, or stake in the company itself. You're just buying the cryptocurrency um, and, the, and you, know, you have the value that that cryptocurrency may have in the future. And you may be able to use that cryptocurrency on the platform that that um, company is, is producing. Okay. So a company might want to start a project and they are trying to raise money. So they accept cryptocurrency in exchange for their version right. of a cryptocurrency? Yeah, so, so for example, you might be um, trading Ether or you know, Ethereum in, re in return for this new cryptocurrency. And then this company would have a whole bunch of Ethereum that they could then exchange into actual dollars to use to fund their project. So why would I want to invest in an ICO? Sure. So you might want to invest in an ICO if um, it's a project that you really believe in. So there have been some very successful ICOs of companies that are, you know, building real products and doing real things. Um, the, the danger that has emerged is that there are some um, startups and companies that maybe don't even intend to build a real product. Maybe they're just putting, they've put out a white paper and they just want to do what's called a sort of a pump and dump scheme where they um, want to get a lot of people to buy their cryptocurrency uh, and that increases the value of the cryptocurrency held by those initial early investors. So yeah. maybe an inner circle and then they can go turn around and sell that for, you know, sell that back for a lot of money and not deliver anything in return. So that's the danger. Now, it seems like there's a lot of risk with ICOs. Is there, is there a good incentive to use an ICO to fund a, a project legitimately? I mean, yeah, so the, the reason why people do it is because you can, um, you can raise a lot of money. People have raised a lot of money through ICOs. Uh, they don't need to go through the traditional avenues like venture capital or a, a public offering. They can do it much sooner. So you could, you could release a white paper today and have your ICO next week and okay. you know, be raising money and only really have this idea. And you can make a lot of money from that. You could. Uh, check out my ICO in the description. <laughs> so one thing that we can also talk about in conjunction with cryptocurrency, um, it's, it's really another application of blockchain technology. It's called smart contracts. And what it is is basically a, a, a contract that is hard coded into the blockchain um, such that when certain conditions are met, a transaction is enabled to occur. So okay. the, my favorite analogy that I've heard that's not related to the blockchain, but it's, you can think of it almost like a vending machine. Like, you know, you, you want something that's $2, you put your $2 in, and once it has verified that those $2 have been put in, it spits out, okay. you know, what you wanted, and that, that transaction occurs. So they're exciting because you can think about so many different business um, instances where you want, um, you want transactions to occur only when certain conditions are met. Um, so this kind of brings blockchain to more use beyond just Right, exactly. That's right. Yeah. And do you want to talk a little bit about what IBM is doing in the uh, space? So at IBM, we have our IBM blockchain platform, which enables you to build blockchain solutions. You can write chain code. You can invite people to your network and other organizations. Um, and you can do this in a way that's, that's very flexible and uh, that's tailored really to the needs of your particular use case and business. Well, cool. I think we covered everything. I um, think so, yeah. <laughs> anything else you have to say about Bitcoin um, or blockchain? Uh, it's, it's always a great day to blockchain. Yeah. <laughs>
Well, thank you so much, Carolyn, for joining us. Uh, I'm sure we'll do some other content in the future. Let us know, guys, what kind of content you would like to see. Just leave it in a comment below and let us know if you have any questions. Where can people connect with you? You can find me on Twitter at Carolyn Rogers. All right, well, thank you so much. Thanks, Caleb.